this is, my goodness. I mean, really, this is, is mind-blowing what we're witnessing right now. In September 2008, Hurricane Ike surged out of the Gulf of Mexico and slammed into the Texas coast in the dead of night. Over 100 lives were lost and damages topped $30 billion. Yet scientists warn it could have been even worse. Had Ike's eye shifted just a few miles, it might have driven a 25-foot surge straight into Galveston Bay in Houston's industrial heart. A doomsday scenario with many more lives lost and hundreds of billions in economic losses. Ike was a wake-up. Call. Emerging from this realization was a bold idea called the Ike Dyke. The Ike Dyke is envisioned as a massive coastal barrier system to guard Galveston Bay. It would protect millions of people, homes, and critical industries from hurricane storm surges. I recently traveled to the very location where the storm barrier could one day sit, so we can dive deep into its engineering design, all the controversy surrounding it, and how it could be implemented in practice. Over a century ago, the Great Storm of 1900 struck Galveston with terrifying force. A 15-foot surge killed over 6,000 people, making it the deadliest natural disaster in U.S. history. In response, the city was raised by several feet, and this massive seawall was constructed along Galveston's coast. It stood 17 feet tall and became the city's first line of defense against the Gulf. And indeed, in the 20th century, it saved lives. When another major hurricane hit in 1915, the seawall protected much of Galveston. Fast forward to 2008, and modern Galveston had grown beyond the original seawall's coverage, and countless communities ringed the broader Galveston Bay. Enter Hurricane Ike. Ike's counterclockwise winds drove bay waters ashore on the Bolivar Peninsula and into Galveston Bay. Entire blocks on Bolivar were scoured clean. Famously, only one solitary house remained standing amid miles of destruction. This realization that Hurricane Ike was a close call for a nationally catastrophic disaster galvanized local leaders and scientists. One of them was Dr. Bill Merrill, a marine scientist at Texas A&M. In 2009, Merrill proposed the concept of a coastal spine to protect the entire Galveston Bay region from surge. Locals began calling it the Ike Dyke, after the storm that had made its necessities so apparent. The Ike Dyke was inspired by the Great Dutch Flood Defenses. They built the Delta Works, a network of dams and surge gates, shortening their coastline and sealing off estuaries when storms threatened. Merrill's vision was to do something similar for Galveston, erect a barrier along the Gulf Coast with giant floodgates at the bay's entrance to stop hurricane surge from ever entering Galveston Bay. But is this even possible? To start talking about this, I'm here at Bolivar Roads. And without a doubt, the centerpiece of all this is the Bolivar Roads gate system. Starting on the Bolivar Peninsula side, the structure begins as a three-mile levee tied directly into the newly built beach and dune system. It has a relatively flat gulf-facing slope armored with stone to absorb direct wave loading, and a steeper bayside slope where water levels and wave energy are lower. It'll most likely be made up of an engineered fill. Imagine a clay-like material that's impermeable and cohesive. Next is a combined wall segment for about a mile. Here, large vertical concrete piles are paired with battered steel piles and capped by a continuous concrete deck. In shallower portions of the inlet, the line is carried by shallow water environmental gates. These are roughly 16 by 16 feet stainless steel gates set within concrete towers. In day-to-day -day operation, the gates are stored in the raised position inside the tower, which can be shut during surge events. As depths increase near the navigation channel, the system shifts to large vertical lift gates, each about 300 feet wide between two concrete towers, with a steel panel raised or lowered by hydraulic or hoist machinery. These gates are typically kept fully or mostly open to keep currents within limits and reduce wear. Ship traffic uses dedicated navigation gates. Along the main channel, 125 foot wide sector gates serve tugs, barges, and smaller craft, retracting into island recesses when open to traffic and wake. For deep draft vessels, two 650 foot wide floating sector gates sit in concrete islands that double as dry docks. In normal conditions, they're dried, inspections, and protected. Before a storm, the dock floods, the gate floats and rotates into place, then is ballasted onto a sill about 60 feet down to create a tight seal. The gate's pizza slice shape forces water pressure to run mainly in compression along the curve instead of bending a flat plate, which makes them much more efficient and robust at huge widths. Modeling suggests that this system can cut surge entering the bay by an average of 30 to 60 percent. The Bolivar Road system ties into a much larger nature-based line of defense. 43 miles of engineered beach and dune segments on Bolivar Peninsula in West 
West Galveston Island. Typical sections have dune crests with vegetation planted to stabilize the sand, around 14 feet NAVD 88. But if you're like me, you're probably wondering what that means. NAVD 88 is a fixed nationwide zero elevation used for engineering, which is different from local sea level because sea level moves over time with tide, storm, and long-term rise. By tying everything to this value that was set back in 1988, instead of the water surface, designers can compare elevations and surge levels consistently. On Galveston, the protection system starts at the western end of the historic seawall and runs to San Luis Pass. On Bolivar, it runs for more than 20 miles and ties into the other restoration work to the northeast. Along the urban waterfront, the plan raises low sections of the Galveston seawall, adds armoring and closure structures at road openings, and builds transitions that tie the wall into the system. Inside the bay, the focus shifts to managing residual risk, the surge that gets past the Gulf Line. Here, the 18-mile Galveston ring barrier system forms a second structural line around the bay side of the city. It consists of pump stations, levees and flood walls, and road and rail gates distributed along an inland alignment. Further up the bay, short wall and gate systems are planned at the entrances to Clear Lake and Dickinson Bay. In both cases, the idea is to place a relatively compact structure across the narrow channel that connects a large, low-lying floodplain to the main bay. Okay, so now that we've talked about the design, why hasn't this already been built? The Ike Dyke is often referred to as the largest civil engineering project in U.S. history. While many would name the Hoover Dam, Panama Canal, or Interstate Highway System, the fact that the Ike Dyke is even mentioned in the same breath speaks to its immense scale. And I say that because a project of this size was never going to move forward without controversy. The debate increasingly centers on money, alternatives, and politics. The Ike Dyke Mega Project is expected to cost $34 billion. Or should I say was expected to cost $34 billion. That cost jumped by 67% to a staggering $57 billion to reflect rising costs if the project is paid over the expected 20-year period it would take to design and build. The federal cost share could potentially cover about two-thirds of that, with Texas and local sponsors to fund the remaining share. Supporters argue that when hurricane alike caused on the order of $30 billion in losses, and when a direct hit on the Houston Ship Channel could trigger economic impacts far beyond that, it makes some financial sense. The project will require a series of separate federal appropriations spread over many years and multiple administrations, each of which must prioritize this system over competing projects. On the Texas side, legislators and local governments would still need to work through who pays how much, and what financial tools are politically acceptable. It's a complex puzzle. Millions of residents and small businesses are directly in the risk zone, but so are refineries, petrochemical plants, and port facilities. Any cost-sharing plan will feel unfair to some, whether that's taxpayers, local governments, or industry. And speaking of that, alternative strategies have resurfaced. One camp argues for a more targeted, cheaper, industrial shield approach. Focus on the Houston Ship Channel and adjacent petrochemical complexes, except that some low-lying residential and tourist areas will remain at high risk. Another set of proposals pushes mid-bay gate concepts, closing surge farther inside Galveston Bay with narrower structures and more use of dredged material islands as energy dissipators. Those options reduce cost and environmental impact, but they would leave places like Galveston and Bolivar exposed in a worst-case scenario. Environmental issues are still part of the debate, but they're often framed through the lens of permitting and cost. The reality is that any barrier this large must withstand legal and regulatory scrutiny under federal environmental laws, and designing to pass that scrutiny adds time, complexity, and cost. Ultimately, the Ike Dyke's future hinges on funding and governance, committing to a multi-decade, region-wide system, or settle for a cheaper patchwork of local defenses and incremental adaptations. It was really difficult to trim this video down to under 10 minutes, and I unfortunately had to skip over quite a bit of information. If this project does get improved one day, who knows? Maybe I'll come back down and look at things in a bit more detail. I'm Josh, this is Billcore. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.